Now we're moving on to hybridization of atomic orbitals. So as we go through this, as the mixing of atomic orbitals into an atom, generally the central atom would generate a set of hybrid orbitals. So these orbitals are actually combining together in this situation. So the two more orbitals combine together, two more of these atomic orbitals combine together, and so we actually form our hybrid orbitals. So an S and a P, for example, S, P, D come together. So an example here, kind of get an idea of why this hybridization actually takes place, is a good example to start with carbon. With carbon, we see, well, carbon is in group 14, has four valence electrons, loves to form, form bonds. Well, that all sounds good, and all good and all, but and we see the electron configuration. We see that it has two in the S and two in the P, so it has four valence electrons. But then we look at the orbital diagram. The orbital diagram paints a different picture here because we realize, well, according to the orbital diagram, there's only two lone electrons and they're both in the 2p. The two, the, the two that are in the s have a filled orbital so they're not going to form a bond. So how can carbon form four bonds? What happens here is that one of the electrons in the 2s jumps up and occupies a room in the p. And So what happens is it's kind of like a remodeling here making up a bigger room and so what happens here is they knock out a wall and they bring the s and the p together. Now four beds can fit in that one room so we now have what we call an s P3, and it is a hybrid orbital. And so this is what carbon does. So now we see that, oh, it has four individual electrons. Therefore, oh, that's why it can form four bonds. So again, carbon, is a four, when it has four single bonds, is called an sp3 hybridized. The procedure of hybridization of atomic orbitals. Hybridization of atomic um, of these orbitals only applies to molecules only applies to molecules in this process because again um, we're not talking, in other words we're not talking about ionic bonds here. Hybridization is a mixture, uh, mixing of at least two or more equivalent or non-equivalent atomic orbitals. And for example we're talking about the S and the P or the S and the P, the D can all come together. So these hybrid orbitals have different shapes than the atomic orbitals. So the atomic orbital we go for an S, an S remember is a simple sphere, a P was a figure eight. When they come together what happens here is we get a kind of offside when the S it kind of gains weight on one side of your P and becomes light lop lopsided with the SP in this process here. And so it is a different shape than the actual atomic orbital is by itself. Well these two SPs come together and form kind of a um, magnified P shape. Um, which actually has been kind of blown up here a little bit as they actually come together. Now the number of hybrid orbitals is equal to the pure to the number of pure atomic orbitals. We're going to get into this a little more. Kind of stick with me here as we go through this. So again, we see another situation here. We have sp hybridized orbitals. We have an s and a p, exactly what I just showed you. And what happens here again? It will form. It forms this as these actually come together. Um, it will actually form again the sp bonds. Now hybridization requires an input of energy. However, this energy is more than recovered during the bond formation. Because when the bonds actually form, you must release energy to form bonds, actually to kind of make room, you must release energy to make room. And that process is exothermic, therefore that energy is released back out. The covalent bonds are formed by a overlap of the hybrid orbitals with the atomic orbitals. That's how this whole process occurs. And we saw this again in the little diagram of beryllium trichloride. In this situation, we, we saw that the SP hybridized orbitals, we have the beryllium and the again chloride overlap here in this process and they form the SP hybridized orbital. Kind of give you an idea here, kind of give you a breakdown as we go through this. Let's kind of walk through these different types and examples of hybridization. We have first of all hybridized, we'll do an SP. SP and this is where you have two single bonds. What we're going to do, we're going to run through our ideal structures right here, our ideal geometry. We're going to run through them. So now you can see that you can also see, okay, oh yeah, drawing out Lewis structures, these ideal geometries, not only goes to the, the, the bond angle, not only goes to the name, but also SP hybridization, this hybridization also comes into play. The example here would be boron, um, beryllium trichloride. Beryllium is in group two, only has two valence electrons, only wants to form two bonds. But we see the beryllium, we're going to focus on the central atom here. Okay, beryllium again has um, two valence electrons. My, my S is full, so it wasn't, doesn't want to form a bond. So how does it form two bonds? Well, an S and one of the two P's come together and form an SP3 
P. So two of these room beds come together, rooms come together and form um, come together and form this SP. The shape is linear. We know that the bond angle is 180. Well, SP2, SP2 has three single bonds, and this again is an example of boron trifluoride. In this situation, we're focusing on boron. We're not focusing on the fluorine, we're focusing on the central atom. Boron has three valence electrons, two are paired up, and so what happens here, it occupies two of the P rooms and forms an SP2. This was a trigonal planar, and the bond angle was or is 120. The next we have sp3, and this is where our carbon falls into play, and this is where we have, you see with methane, carbon loves the form for bonds. In this situation, how to do it? Well, it occupies all one of the s, the one s, and all three of the p's, so it forms an sp3. They actually blend together. They're all individual electrons. Now they can all form four, four bonds can be formed here. This was a tetrahedron. The bond angle is 109.5. The next ideal geometry we ran into is an sp3d, and in this situation there are five single bonds actually being formed here, and so we see with the phosphorus pentachloride in this situation. Now focusing on phosphorus, realize, remember we told you that anything in 15 and 16 had to be in group 3 or beyond. Why was it group 3 or beyond? Because in group 3 or beyond, that's where the d orbital actually came into play. In, group, in, in level 2, then there was no, again, Energy level 2, there was no d orbital, was not present yet. So as energy level 3, the d orbital becomes present. Therefore, this expansion can actually occupy because we realize that my S is full um, and all three of my P rooms are occupied, or P rooms are occupied. Therefore, I need to, my, to open up one of the um, electrons in my S, I need to jump all the way up to the D. And so I occupy one of my Ds. So it's an SP3D. And so this was, again, shape was a trigonal bipyramid, trigonal bipyramid. Next we ran into, the next one we ran into, again, this trigonal bipyramid, you remember that you had the, um, you had the 90s and you had the 120s. The next one we have, we have SP3D2, and this was your six single bonds, and this was our sulfur hexafluoride. And now in the same situation, we've actually, um, all six want to form bonds, so the one from the S and the P jump up and occupy two of the D rooms. So you have sp3d2, and this was our octahedron. All the bond angles are 90 degrees. So we see this hybridization. That's what allows these electrons to form these actual bonds. When we talk about the valence electrons, it gives you a clearer picture of what's happening with these electrons. Now, to predict the hybridization of a central atom of each of the following, it's actually easy. You're just going to count the things around the central atom. Lone pairs count as a thing. Double bonds count as a thing. Del um, single bonds are a thing. So let's count the things around it. So if you saw the first one, you see, well, HgCl2. Uh, mercury is a transition metal. Two bands of electrons by default wants two things around it. So it's Hc um, chlorine on either side. So counting the things around it, you see there's one chlorine, there's two chlorines. So it's an S and a P. Remember, you always have one S, but then you have three possible P's. There's a S, P. We'll talk about aluminum triiodide. In this situation, my aluminum has three things around it, so an S, a P, and a P. So let me go through this example down here, kind of show you this. This, I would say, it doesn't matter where you start, but if I said this is my S, this is a P, and this is a P. So it's an S. P1, P2, SP2. Now, in this next situation, we have your phosphorus um, trifluoride. In this situation, your phosphorus in group 15 wants to form five, has five valence electrons. So it now has a lone pair. That lone pair becomes a thing. So a lone pair is my S. My fluorines are my P. So it's now an S. Again, we go through the process down here. We see that this is. This will make this my S, this is a P, this is a P, and this is a P. So it's now an SP3, SP3. So you just count the things around. It actually makes it kind of easy in that process. But first of all, you have to be able to draw the Lewis structure. So it all comes back down to the Lewis structure. That's why I told you why it's so critical. Hybridization of SP and D orbitals for elements in the third period beyond. The SP and D orbitals all contri um, contribute to hybridization.
The expanded octets can be explained by the hybridization of the D orbital. Because there is no D subshell in the second period, that's why we didn't have the expanded octet in group 15 and 16 in the second period, because D wasn't even present yet. So as we saw here, where our phosphorus um, uh, pentabromide in this situation you have again you have again our phosphorus has five valence electrons and in order to get five uh, any single electrons had to jump up and occupy one of the D's and so it became an sp3d1 sulfur hexafluoride became an sp3d2 so one of the my one S room bed was or room was used the three p rooms were used and two of the d rooms had to be occupied in order for there to become six individual electrons so again diagram of the hybrid orbitals again be able to go through this again we talk about all going all, all the way back to the lewis structures just ties right back in with the lewis structures being able to draw the lewis structure and then from that, from you'll be able to get the bond angle, the name. You'll be able to do the hybridization of the central atom. You need to be able to walk through all this process. Hybridization in molecules contains double and triple bonds. Let me talk about this. Okay, contain double and triple bonds. That's where we talk about these. The pi comes into play. We've all, always single bonds. We always have a pi. So in a double bond, one of my bonds is a pi. The other one's, I mean, it's a sigma, excuse me. You always have sigmas. In a tro bond, one of my three bonds is a sigma, my other two are pi. So we always have sigmas, but now we're going to bring into the situation now the pi. And the pi bonds form p orbitals overlap ab above and below the plane. So we see this in the situation here. We have our carbon, and and if you look at each individual carbon here, you would say, okay, these carbons, again, this, this is my S, this is my P, and this is my P. So this carbon is an SP2. Each of these carbons are forming an SP2. There's three things, there's three things around it, okay, in this process. And that process, so we say, okay, an SP3, SP2, excuse me. Um, in this situation, though, again, we have this bond between the carbon is a double bond. One of them is a sigma bond. What happens here, again, because of this, it's what happens here, how's my other, uh, my pi bond coming to play? There are actually these other electrons that are actually coming up and now these are coming straight up and down. So what can happen? This is a pi, um, pi bond. It requires two of these P's to become a pi bond. So in the situation here, whether they're going to form above, form a bond above and below, and they form one bond. Even though you see, oh, it looks like two bonds there. No, this is one bond. This is one bar is what we see here. This is very, very important you understand that. That's one bar together. So I have one, two, and that's a double bond. So the P orbitals are overlapping there in that situation. So I give an example here, kind of focusing off of carbon. We see when it's in SP3. There's four things around it. There's an sp3, four things around it. Then we're going to say the atomic orbital, again, orbital diagram looks like this. It was, again, they had to hybridize, get four, four and four bonds. So it ended up being like this. All of the bonds are single, so it has four sigma bonds and zero pi bonds. In this next situation, where there's a double bond, my carbon now becomes an sp2 in this situation. And with this, an sp P2, um, it has, we realize that these were the only ones were used, but it still has a pi bond that will left out here. So there's three things around it. These guys were actually used, but I have, I have, a, I have a P bond over here. So what happens, the P going up here and the going over here form a bond, and this forms a pi bond. Okay, because both the carbons have this. And so we form here, we have three sigmas, three singles, and one pi. In the next situation now, we have two things around my one of, one of the carbons, so it's an sp. And of my sp, I actually only use, again, all these, this again jumps up here, but then we jump up here and hybridize, we realize the only, only ones being used are the s and the p, those are my single bonds. Here are my single bonds, and then my two pi bonds. 
Examples here of what the difference is between where the carbon forms an sp3 or an sp2. I actually go back between the diamond and graphite. And diamond in this situation, with the sp3, we see there's actually three things around it. And you actually kind of take a look at three things around it. Um, and we look at one of the one of the central atoms. We have one one thing here. You have two here. You have three here. And you have four there. So it's an S, P1, P2, P3. And that process causes a strong overlapping here with all these, these four single bonds. Um, helps in the process. And keeps it tightly knit and forms this, again, extremely strong structure. Uh, then we look over here at graphite. Graphite around the central atom, around one of the central atoms, we only have um, one... Two, oh, sorry, one, two, three things around it. Get rid of this guy. So one, two, three things around it. So an S, P1, P2, and it forms planar in this situation, and that's why it's much weaker at the graphite. Determine the hybridization of each carbon shape of each molecule, label sigma pi's. In this situation, we have where well, we have single bonds right here. Carbon central has an oxygen coming up. Oxygen likes two bonds and two lone pairs. My hydrogen likes a single bond. I have three things around it. It's an sp3. Um, I have a sigma here, a sigma here, and a sigma here. But the second bond in my double bond is a pi. So I have three sigmas and one pi. In this situation, I have two carbons in my situation here. And we're going to have, again, my carbons here are going to form a trio bond. I'm going to have a sigma here, a sigma here, and one sigma here. But my other two bonds making up my trio bond are both pi's. So I have one, two, three sigmas and two pi's. So the sigma, so three sigmas, two pi's. And this is an S, so it's an SP. Two things around. Just again, look at one carbon alone when you, when you figure that out. So the SP hybridization.